everybody. I pray you had a wonderful week. I got this piece of sequoia from a friend, Carl, all the way from Washington. I really appreciate you sending that to me, Carl. He also sent me some redwood that I'm going to be uh, casting in another color, so keep an eye out for that. The bark for this um, sequoia was awesome. It had all these pits and holes and everything, and when I was looking up online to see what the sequoia tree looked like, um, I realized, okay, wait a minute, why isn't the sequoia tree have the bark like the, that came on this chunk that I had gotten? Well, come to find out that the reason why the bark looks so pity and holy and, and interesting like that is because a yellow-bellied sapsucker woodpecker, <laughs> I try to say that ten times fast, um, they literally attack the tree and they have they just cause all these pits and holes and some of the images I pulled on Google I mean some of these trees they just were riddled with these holes and this piece there wasn't a piece of bark that didn't have a hole in it so it was very interesting to learn that that's um, why this piece of wood had that interesting bark I did save the bark because it was just really cool looking and I did cast it in with this piece when I decided to cast it the piece was really dry and punky and had some cracks in it, and I really wanted to turn it um, without resin, but in order to save it, it was kind of a must. So I'm just shaping it to get it to fit in my Rubbermaid mold that I got from the Dollar Tree. Those seem to work really, really well, and they pop out really easy out of that cheap plastic, at least with my experience. Um, so I'm going to cast it into three in the 3 to 1 total boat, with rose color and the silver pearl, I think it is. Um, those colors are in the link in the description below with the interference purple, or interference violet, sorry, in both of the colors. That's what kind of gave it that purpley, you know, it looks really, really pink when I poured it, but you'll see in the final piece, it looks more purple. So, anywho, I did have to do a second pour on this one, which I did not record the second pour. Um, I just ran out about seven to eight hours later and dumped some more resin in there and did a little bit of a lighter color and a little more swirly um, going on with it and threw it back in the pressure pot so that way I would have it ready for the weekend. Um, so I'm mixing it all up and just going to dump it in and put it in the pressure pot. I fill my pressure pot to 50 to 60 pounds of pressure and I know a lot of them recommend not going over 60 so just make sure that your pressure pot can handle that kind of pressure. The reason why I put 60 in is because mine has a really, really slow leak, so it doesn't stay at 60 very long. By the time I come back up to the shop later on, it's like at 30. So, but it's enough pressure to get the air bubbles out. I don't have any problems with it at all. It seems to work just fine. Right now I'm looking around for something to, <laughs> to hold it down because it's floating. So I drilled a um, 55 millimeter um, with my Forstner bit hole in the top because um, the bark was very uneven there. So I couldn't put, you know, wormwood screw, and I didn't want to lose that that peak of wood that was sticking up out of the resin. I envisioned on using it as a lip for, you know, a hollow form shape didn't know exactly what shape I was going for because with resin pieces you kind of just you want to have just enough resin in it and just enough of the wood so you can actually see the wood and I really really loved the look of this wood so I was honestly more interested in the wood and having the resin just fill in those areas where I just was lacking in in that so that was kind of my thought process um, by casting it that way and I know there's a lot of resin that is getting taken off um, but I don't have you know a million different size molds to get it to the exact shape that you know or down to the I guess the exact size or whatever that you want you kind of just throw it in there and, and hope that you get enough coverage of resin usually is is the um, issue and and get enough um, of those cracks and those punky areas because the 
the point of this was just to be able to save the wood and and utilize it and you know anyways the negative rake scrapers work really well on this except for when you're impatient and you can't turn very fast because it's so you know wobbly I just chose to go ahead and go at it with my um, my bowl gouge and it does chip out when you do that when you when you go really really fast with your bowl gouge but I knew I was going to be taking a whole lot of that off so if you intend on keeping a lot of the resin and you're you know you're almost near to the shape that you want for your final um, I wouldn't suggest using your your bowl gouge like I had because it just chips it shatters out like crazy but I had planned to take a lot away so that's why I just went ahead and risked it with the you know chips flying everywhere Of course my camera is acting up and decided to take a ton of photos instead of doing a video so here in a minute you'll see a really odd colored fast clip I just didn't want you to miss out like right here it, I didn't want you to miss out on some of the shaping because um, you would be watching the next clip and there would be a lot of the <laughs> shape has changed so I chose to go ahead and just squish all the photos together and try to make somewhat of a viewable uh, clip out of it so that way you can see how I'm shaping the bottom. I left meat on the bottom because I wasn't sure if I wanted a foot um, on this piece or not. I was kind of just going with the flow with it. So I left meat at the bottom on purpose and then shaped the top part and then kind of came down and into the foot just just to get that flow of it so that's why I left so much down at the bottom because I wasn't quite sure and of course I'm going with what the wood is doing and how much resin and wood I'm just filling a lot of the punky areas with my CA glue my Starbon um, the thin and there was a few cracks and pits in the wood um, in between the wood and resin where there could have possibly been air bubbles um, and there was obviously cracks you know to begin with in the wood so I'm just filling those to be sure before I start to sand and, and put my final finish on it that they're all good and filled I used a little darker purple just something to give it you know a little different contrast because there wouldn't be much showing anyway Now at this point, I have to be honest, I was getting very excited because the piece was, you know, working out the shape that, you know, just everything was flowing and, and um, the, the lip for the opening of the vessel was exactly like how I was hoping. I was hoping I wouldn't have to take any of that off. I really wanted to showcase that live, kind of like a live edge, you know, lip for the hollow form. So you can imagine you know and you know when you have a project that you're just kinda like yes it's it's all working out it's all starting to come together and and it's a beautiful shape you know so you start dumping all of your energy and, and time in it and emotion and, and a part of you because it is you know something you worked really hard on so I was very happy at this point sometimes you get to projects and you quite don't know how it's really gonna look until it's almost said and done but I was I was getting quite happy um, with this piece very early on so that's that's nice and and those of you who um, may feel that same way about some of your projects too will understand for sure that it's one of those kind of oh let's see if I'm not gonna screw this up or or if this is really gonna work out or you're not quite sure how it's gonna look until you turn it around or take it off the lathe because that sometimes is how I don't know either until I take it off and stare at it with my head tilted to the side. <laughs> um, so I sanded this piece all the way to a thousand grit. Um, with the resin, you have to, you know, as 
as you sand in between the grits, you have to sand the opposite direction, not turning in the opposite direction, but say you have the piece rolling towards you. Now you want to go up and down just so that way, because that resin was really soft and to get those deeper scratches out, I was being very mindful of the scratches and, and going back if I have to, to get the deeper ones out or just taking a little bit more time hand sanding because some spots needed more than others. So I'm using my um, DIY, I guess, sanding sealer. It's just 50-50 denatured alcohol and shellac. I put about two or three coats on there because the wood was really punky. So um, it didn't feel punky anymore. It was all, all very nice and smooth, but I just wanted to you know, get that sanding sealer in there, absorb really well. And the burning iron um, link is below a lot of had a lot of questions about that so I put the website link below so you can check out um, if you want to have one of yours made I'm using a DIY sanding paste and this um, mixture that I made I used two different um, grits of pulmis so I used a medium grit and then I used a DE powder which is the diametaceous earth I had a big batch of just the diametaceous earth and I wanted to add, um, make another uh, batch that was more gritty and I didn't want to waste the other batch. So I went ahead and just added them together and the results were great. I was very happy with it even after the first um, pass with it. It was very smooth and shiny and the resin looked really good. So like I said, I sanded to about a thousand grit and then I used two coats of my DIY uh, sanding paste just to get it extra smooth looking like glass and also made my own um, polishing paste too. Uh, you can look for recipes on online for that. It's a pretty basic um, mineral oil and, and beeswax mix. I add a little bit of either lavender oil or lemon oil to mine because I like the smell and both of those oils, natural oils, are antibacterial so antimicrobial or whatever you want to call it. So that's what I'm doing now. I did, in the end, put a shellac, I'm sorry, a OB Shine Juice over the whole piece, but I didn't want to do that yet until I turned it around in case I had to modify the rim for whatever reason because I wasn't sure of what condition would be once I turned it around. So to save myself product and the extra step when I could just polish it all at once, First, I'm establishing the rim and making sure that um, you know that that can be done, and I don't have to take it off. You know, you're being very, um, I guess, patient <laughs> would be a good word for the with the rim because I really wanted to keep it on there. I had a few pieces of resin and tape that was stuck on there, but I was able to just take them and pull them off with my finger, and the one chunk of resin that was stuck on the bark I just sanded it down so it just blended perfectly with the rest of it. I'm taking my 55 millimeter Forstner bit and hollowing out as much as I can. The um, Easywood uh, hollower worked really well on this but I do need to get a new blade. Um, and I say worked really well is because it reaches in there. I want to warn you that um, punky woods do not like scrapers. It doesn't matter if it's negative rake, any kind of scraper. It just at least with my experience, it doesn't, it, it literally just rolls that stuff out and it just, it's like <laughs> a wood chipper is inside of your piece. Sorry, I have really funny ways of uh, explaining things. I just don't know how it's to explain sometimes. Um, it really worked well getting into that rim and it's just, just patience because you can't take a ton at once. Um, it's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. These passes and um, every once in a while I try to reach in there with you know a negative rake scraper and it just it wasn't cutting anything so this this uh, carbide worked excellent because nothing else that I could reach in there was was doing it at all um, as punky as it was it was just real awkward to try to cut um, in that hole for one and and for another because it was it was still wobbly because of the out of balance that's going on with the resin and the wood, um, I assume. So I couldn't really turn very fast because of 
it just wanted to vibrate and that vibration isn't good when you're trying to cut punky wood because then you're just then you're beating wood out of it <laughs> so I'm using a mid-size uh, carbide rougher to get and um, to take out because this took out a little bit more material at once I was able to uh, versus the the hollower so I was just switching back and forth trying to clear out some more material and then get in there around that lip it's not hollowed out really thin for one I don't have the my hollower wouldn't fit any further so whether I wanted to or not it wouldn't have mattered um, plus the wood was very punky and I just was afraid that if I went too thin um, you know I just didn't want it to crack or, or make it to where it wasn't as stable so that's why I didn't get it too terribly thin but it's it's probably about it's a little less than half inch I measured it Sending this was real awkward and hard to get in to the bellow, I guess, of the piece, and so I just did um, the best I could with my with my hand and my little stick sander that I made. But it's it's so punky um, that you know you either can you cut it to where it's a little smoother to kind of help you out in the sanding process, and being that that wasn't a possibility. Um, I just sanded the heck out of it and I even still had a lot of um, that punky those those pits from the the grain tearing out so I decided the best finish for the inside that would be a lot easier and that would fill that really well was to do a resin I'm just going over it with my um, DIY abrasive paste to get the scratches off from around the rim and places where I couldn't reach when it was turned around the other direction and getting that top surface, the top of it all smooth and then I'm putting the um, polishing paste over the whole thing um, before I put resin. I didn't put the OB Shine juice on until after the resin was all said and done. Um, I don't know why, I guess in my mind I felt if the resin got on the piece, dripped onto the piece now, I wouldn't have to go and try to, you know, get that off or sand that off and ruin the final finish when it would be a lot easier to kind of remedy if I hadn't, you know, did the final finish yet. So that was my thought process. I'm just using a, um, a foam brush. I wish I would have, you know, had some better brushes at this time but I couldn't find them. It was kind of cool in my shop so the the resin was just thick and really hard to get spread out so I just have this mini hair dryer that I keep in the shop. Um, it has a cool setting on it as well so I just have it on warm to help loosen it up. And when I did that it caused a little bit of air bubbles which is fine um, because I knew I was just going to go in there and wipe it away. I did three total coats. I didn't film all three coats but just to give you an idea this the same process. I just the second coat I left on the lathe and left it running at slowest speed to get it all put on there and the same with the third coat same thing. So this is the piece with the OB Shine Juice as the final finish. I hope you guys enjoyed and I pray you have a wonderful week. God bless.